be following us later uh, when this airs on the Eternal Life TV station. We thank you and we appreciate every one of you because, again, tonight we want to just discuss Jesus and the things that he has for us in the word of the Lord. Amen. Amen. We don't come with our own opinions. We don't come with our own perspective. We don't come from an intellectual perspective. We don't come from a point where we're looking to argue or to debate the word. Anyone that knows me knows that I give you the scripture, what thus saith the Lord. And after that, I cease and we have discussion centered around the word after that. Amen. So again, tonight, we're grateful for each and every person and we thank God for you because without you, without you, there is no us and there is no importance or relevance to us being here. But I thank the Lord for, again, the opportunity. We thank the Lord for the God in Light Prayer Line family, uh, Apostle Angela Bannerman, uh, Pastor uh, Apostle Michael Bannerman, also Apostle Dion Bannerman, as well as Prophetess Maya Bannerman. Amen. And we thank God for giving them this vision, uh, which is a very active vision. It's blessed so many different people and so many different men and women of God have come to put in their oil, put in their lot with this ministry to help shore it up. And we constantly want to keep uh, them in prayer as well as the visionaries of this uh, great uh, prayer line in our prayers continuously uh, because God is going to do great and mighty things through them. Whether we remain apart or not, it does not negate the plan and the will and the mind of God concerning them. And we're just thankful for the Lord for the privilege to be honored to be and humbled by it, to be a part of this line. So tonight we're going to continue in our study uh, entitled Uncommon Allegiance and Valor. And those who have been on the line know that whenever we get involved in a series, we go through that series, we, we, we extract everything that we can get from it until the Lord says that we f are finished. But then there are times that we'll go back and forth into other topics as the Lord sees fit. Uh, but tonight, we're going to continue in that study. Uh, and we're going to be going to uh, 1 Samuel, I believe we're going to be in the 5th chapter. I'm saying I'm believing, but we are in the 5th chapter. Uh, tonight, we're going to be looking at verses uh, 17 uh, through 24 uh, within that particular chapter. Uh, and the title of tonight, for those of you that are taking notes, and uh, the title for tonight is, What Else Does the Anointing Attract? Again, what else does the anointing attracts? And we'll talk about that from there tonight. Uh, forgive us tonight. We're experiencing a little bit of technical issues with our setup, uh, how the uh, uh, video is showing on both Facebook Live, uh, but we will correct that as far as next week. Amen. Uh, so tonight, looking at the scripture as we read it, 2 Samuel 5, 17 to 24, the first verse reads, But when the Philistines heard that they had anointed David king over Israel, all the Philistines came up to seek David, and David heard of it and went down to the hole. So this is sounds like initially, if you're someone that's glancing through it, Hearing it for the first time, it would sound like this is a, a good meeting or a good opportunity, but this is far from it. Verse 18, the Philistines also came up and spread themselves in the valley of Rephraim. And David inquired of the Lord, saying, Shall I go up to the Philistines? Wilt thou deliver them into my hands? And again, that shows exactly where David's heart's mind and where the Philistines were. Will thou deliver them into my hands? This is actually a military ristic prayer where David is asking God for a strategy in battle that he's going to go up against a foe that has come up against them and that will God deliver them into his hands. Should he pursue them? Should he not pursue them? Will they be victorious? Will they be defeated? Should they go out and expend energy amongst this enemy or against this enemy? And the Lord said unto David, go up. For I will doubtless deliver the Philistines into thine hand. And David came to bel Perezim, And David smote them there and said, The Lord hath broken forth upon mine enemies before me as the breach of waters. 
Therefore, he called the name of that place Belperazim. And there they left their images, and David and his men burned them. Then skipping down to verse 22, And the Philistines came up yet again, and spread themselves in the valley of Rephaim. And David inquired of the Lord, he said, Thou shalt not go up, but fetch a compass behind them, and come up upon them over against the mulberry trees. And let it be, when thou hearest the sound of a going in the tops of the mulberry trees, that then thou shalt bestir thyself, for then shall the Lord go out before thee to smite the hosts of the Philistine. And David did so, as the Lord had commanded him, and smote the Philistines from Geba unto thou come to Gezar. Amen. And tonight again, for those that are just joining in or listening, the topic is what else does the anointing attract? And again, this is a part of our series, Uncommon Allegiance and Valor. So when we look at the very first verse, it says, But when the Philistines heard that they had anointed David king over Israel, all the Philistines came up to seek David, and David heard of it and went down to the hole. So why is this particular verse in the name of Jesus Christ? We thank you. We give you glory and honor once again. So this particular verse says, But when the Philistines heard that they had anointed David king over Israel, all the Philistines came up to seek David. So when we look at this verse here, we know that the Philistines are a natural enemy to the house of Israel. And for those of you that weren't a part of the earlier study, but yet know the scripture, we know this to be factual. And the first encounter that David has with the Philistines in his life was when Israel was on the battlefield and about to confront the Philistines, but yet because of the fear that was in their heart, the fear that was in the heart of their leader, Saul, they were immobilized. They did not go up against the threat that was at their border. But yet, David, one day, by the instructions of his father, went to the battlefield to check on his son or his brothers, along with some supplies that the father had sent. And David heard this behemoth of a man, Goliath, bellowing his threats and defiance against the army of Israel and against God himself. And David, being a very inquisitive youth, young man, didn't understand why Saul and the army were not addressing this threat. But David, in his character and his strength and his boldness, went out and ultimately slew Goliath with a stone then taking Goliath's own sword and beheading him, gaining the victory, causing the hearts of the Philistines to shrink and the armies of Israel's hearts to be encouraged, motivated, lifted up, and emboldened enough to pursue their enemy. So David was a killer of the threats that were poised against the house of Israel. David was already anointed before he even stepped foot on the battlefield. And as a result, his courage, his strength, with the boldness and the anointing of God, was able to meet that threat, that threat that came from another country, a foreign country, the enemies of God. He stood up against it. One of the things I would have started off very early with, point number one, is this. That we, the people of God, must understand that when we are anointed, that isn't to attract good things. That isn't to make our lives comfortable. That is not to make us relaxed. That is not to make us complacent. It's not to build our names, our titles, or our reputations. 
The anointing is given for one specific purpose. To do the will of God. Stand against opposition. Stand against foes. Stand against the enemy. Break and destroy yokes. Whenever you're talking about breaking and destroying yokes, we're talking about yokes that were put on by the enemy. Open up the prison doors. Why are the prison doors being broken and open? Because the enemy has incarcerated the souls and the lives of innocent victims. Why should the anointing destroy the yoke? Because the yoke came from the enemy. Everything that Isaiah expresses about the anointing or the word of the Lord expresses about the anointing is dealing with a person who has been anointed to deal with challenges. I want to say that again. The anointing, if you want to be anointed, if you are anointed, do one major thing. Get out your handkerchief. I wish I had one handy. Dry your weeping eyes. Ask for God to give you courage, to give you boldness, and to fortify you and give you strength. Why? Because, baby, it is time to fight the good fight of faith. God has anointed you for warfare. He has anointed you for a purpose. So when your enemies hear about that, both spiritually, naturally, whomever they may be, guess what? They are going to come for you. You thought that that anointing was cute. You became excited about being anointed. Child, I'm anointed by God. But didn't fully realize what that meant until the attacks came. Let me give you something that will help ground you immediately. When the attacks come, and you know that they're coming frequently, then, and only then, can you and shall you rest assured, <laughs> hallelujah, Jesus, that you are truly anointed by God. This is a time where you become just like David because when you are truly anointed, the enemy is going to chase you down, seek you out, and come and align its forces against you for the purposes of warfare. They want to discombobulate you. They want your mind to be so clouded with the acts of warfare and the potential of warfare. And that warfare is imminent. That you won't prepare properly to meet the threat. That you won't prepare properly to meet the threat. And I want to calm down because I feel myself getting excited. So when we fail to really assimilate and discern and to fully understand what's going on after we have been anointed... And for the threat that lies at our door, we will not properly be prepared to meet the challenge that is at our door. David understood the challenge. And there's a history going on here that we need to talk about. And we'll talk about that in a few minutes. But David understood that this was not a congratulatory meeting. He understood that there was a threat in the air because he understood when word got back to him, 
What type of horses are they on? How are they dressed? Are they dressed in their ceremonial garb? Or are they dressed in their warfare outfits and uniforms and armament along with their weaponry and everything else that goes along with that? Is this a diplomatic contingency? Or is this a threat that we need to address with the proper pieces of information spiritually as well as naturally under the anointing of God, we can properly prepare to meet the threat. Some of us have been misreading the call to warfare. Many of us have been misreading the circumstances of our lives. And some of us, our hearts have fainted within us. But David sought the Lord. And David asked God a question saying, Shall I go up against these Philistines? He asked them multiple questions. Wilt thou deliver them in my hands? But before we go that far, I want to share something very important from verse 18. And I really want you to hear what is being said here. 18, the word of the Lord says this, The Philistines also came and spread themselves in the valley of, a Rephaim. I want to deal with the last word in that verse because this word will help open up our understanding so that we can understand where we're going in this particular study tonight. This word is key because it says the Philistine also came and spread, listen, spread themselves in the valley of Rephaim. Rephaim means invigorating a giant. I want to say that again. Invigorating a giant. So let us listen as the land speaks to us prophetically. When we look at the word Rephaim, Rephaim and it means invigorating a giant. We know that David dealt initially with a giant. So for the Philistines to embark upon this land and to spread themselves out, spreading out their strength, spreading out their might, spreading out their arrogance and their pride, and the fact that they really think that by stepping on this land, that they would be victorious. In other words, what they're saying, we are resurrecting the spirit of our champion, Goliath. And this time, David, king of Israel, we will not be defeated. How often have you had an enemy that you thought you defeated in prayer try to form a resurrection and come after you with a ferocity, with a ferociousness, with a power, with a threat, and with the means to make this threat realize, real, and completely destructive. But what the Philistines thought was in their favor actually worked in defiance against them. Let me break it down even further as I calm myself down even further. 
But they did not understand and realize that they were misreading. <laughs> Thank you, Holy Spirit. They were misreading the conditions under which they were about to attack Israel. Instead of the land testifying on their behalf, instead of the land testifying that they would be victorious, in essence, what God was letting them know by David, by telling David that he would pursue, was this. The power of the giant slayer still resides in my servant David. That alone is more than enough to make you shout. That is more than enough to give you faith unlike you've ever had before. That is more than enough for us to conclude right here in this moment and in this time. Because when we fully understand what the land is speaking into our spirit, anointed vessel of God, if you put your name there, in place of David, the land is already telling you that those enemies that were that saw and heard that you were anointed, that have risen up against you, God is going to raise you up to be a giant in your spirit by the mere fact that you sought God in prayer, in the direction. So here's where you get into the fact that you could take a handful of warriors and defeat thousands upon thousands upon thousands. Why? Because the anointing and the land are in agreement with the warfare that you're engaged in to be victorious. I want to say that again. Because the anointing has united with the land, Rephaim, to say one thing. We are going to stand in agreement. But there's a third piece of land that also will join hands because a threefold cord are not easily broken. And we'll talk about that in a minute. So this word Rephraim means, it's a verb, to give vigor to, to fill with life, energy, and to energize. This is to animate you against your foes. This is called to cause you to buck up, to be exhilarated. And listen to this one, to nerve up. And I'm coming back to that one in just a second. Also, it's talking about revitalize and strengthen. But let's go back to that word, nerve up. Because many of us, our nerves have been shaken. Some of us are so nervous about confronting the enemy and stirring them down that it has a major impact on our ability for success in prayer. I want to say that again. Many of us are so nervous spiritually to face the enemy that we're so nervous in prayer that our prayers aren't effective. Think about that for a few moments. How often do you get so unnerved by the enemy that your boldness and your courageousness and even your ability to successfully vocalize what you need to say in prayer is hindered? The enemy has a voice and a posture and a presence. And let's not play this down. In some cases, it is so powerful that it has actually stopped 
the people of God from praying unto God and believing God and having faith and believing that they have the petitions of their heart. Why do you say this, pastor? Because I've experienced it myself too many times. I've spoken to too many people to whom that has happened to. But when you come into an understanding that the anointing speaks with the land, the land comes into agreement, and listen to this, you are that land. From dust you came, and unto dust you shall return. Using scripture, to verify scripture, line upon line, precept upon precept. Yes, you're flesh and blood, but from dirt you came and to dirt you will return. You are the land. We often think about the land, the ground that we walk on, but yet it does speak. But we're talking about you because when you are in Christ Jesus, According to 1 Corinthians 15, 57, which is the theme scripture for this ministry, we have victory through Jesus Christ. And tonight, I want you to get it in your spirit. But what else does the anointing attract to your life that you are ultimately going to have to stand up against and fight? That word nerve up means that you got to find it deep within yourself to calm your nerves, gain nerve, and stand in the face of the threats that are up against you and stand up against it by gaining a strategy in prayer. David gained his strategy, his orders, his directions in prayer. A leader should never act. The saints of God should never act until we receive divine instructions. Listen to verse 18. And David inquired of the Lord, saying, Shall I go up against the Philistines? Wilt thou deliver them into my hands? And the Lord said unto him, Go up. For I will doubtless deliver the Philistines into thy hands. David dealt with an internal threat, which that which was Saul. But tonight we're looking at why was this so concerning to David in verse 17. So let's talk about that. Verse or chapter 1 of 1 Samuel chapter 1, 17 through 40, 49, 49 to 50, excuse me. That's where David defeated Goliath. In 1 Samuel 27, 1 through 6, we see that David lived amongst the Philistines by going to Achish the king. And Achish granted them with Ziglag. So they lived amongst them while David was running from Saul. But yet, they knew that David had already been anointed as king, but had not ascended to the throne. They knew of the history between David and Saul. And surely Achish thought, since he is the champion of Israel, he can actually now side with us and be our champion along with us. Amen. So we're dealing with, with a champion that now is on, in, in Achish's mind, on his side. But yet, we come to a point where even Achish's men, when they were about to go out against the Philist or the Israelites, that they didn't want David to go with them because of suspicion. You'll find that in 1 Samuel 29, 1 through 11. So they weren't able, David wasn't able to go out against them. But in 1 Samuel 23 and 2, 
we find that David again inquires of the Lord about going out against the Philistines. So there was this love-hate relationship between David and the Philistines. So the Philistines now know that David has been anointed as king again. But now he has assumed the throne and the rights to the throne. And they're wondering, has David served as a double spy? Did he commit espionage against us? Did he come into our borders and steal our secrets, learn our ways, our thought processes, see how we line up in battle and all these things? And now he thinks he's going to take that information and use it against us. Listen. There are some things that each and every one of us have learned by going into the camp of the enemy before we were saved. And even after we were saved, we would tell the truth. And we learned some secrets. And those secrets now are the key for us to defeat him and snatch him others' lives out of the fire and showing them mercy and showing them Jesus Christ. Listen, you know enough information right here and right now. If you were never to go to school, to a college, or a university, you know enough information right now by your own personal experiences about the camp of the devil that he would consider you as you truly are a major threat. But David also went out to a land called, and there David also defeated, that's where David went out. The Bel Parasim, excuse me, Bel Parasim. And that's where in the scripture where even David and his men came up against the Philistines and yet were victorious against them. We have to understand that at every point of our lives that the land actually speaks in favor for us. And let me tell you what Belperazon means. That means a processor of breaches. This is where you learn by the spirit of the living God to exploit the weaknesses of the devil. There's a movie that I love watching and I watched it years ago called Robin Hood with Kevin Costner in there. And when he was teaching the warriors how to defend their village, he's made one statement that stuck with me. He said, even a young boy can be trained to find the clinch in a, in a warrior's armor that they could be successful against that warrior. Listen, your anointing, helps you to exploit the vulnerabilities of your foe. And let me tell you, from personal experience, every single foe, spiritually or naturally, has a clink in their armor. And the only way that you will find it is by going into prayer and seeking the face of the Lord to find it. And once you find it, God will give you a strategy to exploit it, to target it, and bring it down. Why do we think that Joshua and the children of Israel were so successful against Jericho 
because God gave them a spiritual strategy. And on the seventh day, when they blew the horns, the vulnerability of the walls in which they trusted in came tumbling down and were defeated. So tonight, very clearly, God is telling, giving us a profound message and strategy. Nerve up. Find your enemy's vulnerabilities and exploit them because you have been anointed to attract your foes in the spirit to utterly destroy them completely and thoroughly. That is the will of God concerning each and every one of us. Find the weak spots of your enemy and take the enemy down in the name of Jesus. Dry your weeping eyes. Put on your war face. Go into prayer and let God bless you to be able to meet the threat that lies at your door. Let us pray. Father, we thank you in the precious name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, for all things. We pray tonight, God, you gave us very clear instruct instructions and directives. And we thank you for it. Now, God, help us to arise up, knowing that we have been anointed in power. That that anointing is going to attract something that we may not necessarily like or agree with or want or crave or desire. But yet, if we want to be anointed, it's anointed with power to stand up against every threat that comes our way. Now, God, help us to know that the land is speaking, that it's raising us up as giants to the feet and that we shall exploit by Belperazin, every vulnerability of our enemy, because Satan thinks that he is invincible. His, his aligning forces think equally. And God, yes, they have had great opportunity to study mankind. And for many of us, it is our first exposure to the enemy and its onslaughts. But yet, you're even wiser than any foe that we can ever come up against. God, just like you know every single hair and every hair follicle, every blood vessel and every cell and the molecular structures of our bodies and our DNA, you know it thoroughly. You know him even the more. And we come to you for that knowledge and that understanding. Because your word declares since the days of John the Baptist, but that the kingdom take it by force, that we're to take it by force. God, you said in the vow of take it by force. God, Jesus was not afraid of the devil. John the Baptist was not afraid of the devil. Every anointed vessel that even if they were afraid, like Elijah, you made them bold. And even the apostle Paul said that give me boldness that every time that I'll open up my mouth that I will make known the mysteries of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Now tonight, God, I pray that you anoint your people with boldness. And with power and with strength, and that you would cause us to know, God, that the anointing, if we fully understand it, 
It's going to attract things to us. But I love the word that says, but the anointing shall destroy the yoke. And tonight, help us humbly to get it in our spirit. And when we see that a foe is mounting an attack against us, our hearts will not be fearful. We will not move, be moved by it. We will not run into depression. We will not run into frustration. We will not experience insomnia. We will not experience sleeping disorders and running from the challenge that is at hand, God. But we will be bold and courageous and we will stand armed in the Holy Spirit and stir the enemy down and say unto him, we are not afraid of you, Satan. We are not afraid of you opposing force. As a matter of fact, since you were so brazen to step foot on our borders, we are coming up against you and we are going to route this threat back from the very source from whence it came, our victory will not be compromised. Our lands will not be taken. And the authority that rests in the anointing will show you who's most powerful. Jesus Christ, Lord of Lords and King of Kings. And to him we bow and give glory and honor to, in Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Tonight, we've experienced technical issues with Facebook Live, but nonetheless, God is blessed with the word of the Lord, amen. And for those that are listening in that may not know the Lord Jesus Christ, we always never, we never conclude without presenting the Lord Jesus Christ. We pray that if you don't know the Lord Jesus Christ and the pardon of your sins, that tonight you will come to know him in the power and the might of his resurrection. If you're ready to make an informed decision, pray with me. Father, in the name of Jesus Christ, I yield my heart to you. And I pray that you come into my life, live with me, abide with me, both now and forevermore. And God Fill me with your spirit so that I will love you with all my soul and with all my might. In Jesus' great name we pray. Amen and amen. Lord, we're in your presence. And today we come to seek your face, Lord, as we go into the word of the Lord. God, only you can illuminate. Only you can enlighten. Only you can provide the words that we need to govern our souls and our lives. We come to you because you are the source of everything. And as the source of everything, we humbly submit ourselves to you, to your will, to your way, to your authority. And God, we, your people, just say we bless your name. We glorify you. We honor you. We love you. We adore you. We appreciate you. We reverence you. God, open up our ears today to be able to hear what the Spirit of the Lord is saying in the sweetness of this time that we spend together. God, we just love you. We thank you for even the worship that has gone up before you, Lord. We thank you, God. Because in it we rest, in it we bask, in it we live, in it we thrive, because in it you live. In you we live, in you we move, in you we have our being. And God, we might as well not move at all unless we move in you as the psalmist, as the song pins it. So God, we're moving in you today. 
in the sweetness of your love. In Jesus' great and mighty name we pray. Amen and amen and amen. It's always a good thing to give glory and honor and praise unto the Lord, but it's even better yet to worship at his footstool along with the four and the 24 elders and all those who are glorifying the name of Jesus Christ, not because we're looking for anything, but we're looking for him to come. Come, Lord Jesus, come. Amen. And we're just thankful unto the Lord today. Amen. Amen. Won't you, if you're watching us, just give the Lord a praise right now. Amen. Before we go into the word of the Lord, God, we thank you. We bless you. We honor you, God. Hallelujah, Jesus. We honor you, Jesus. Hallelujah. I'm thankful unto the Lord that we have no format, no formality, but we could come before the Lord and just give of the Lord the fruits of our lips and honor unto him. Oh, give thanks unto the Lord for he is good for his mercy endure forever. Hallelujah, Jesus. We could come before the Lord's courts with thanksgiving, with singing, with dancing, with praising and celebrating him because he is worthy to be celebrated. Amen. If you think that our God is a quiet God and does not love celebration, go to praise him, go to worship him, go to adore him out of the fruits of your lips, out of the abundance of your heart, out of your belly that praises spring forth, and you will find that he will step in the midst of you and will honor you because God is still yet seeking to tabernacle with his people. Hallelujah, Jesus. Today we are continuing in a study that we started some time ago, a series entitled Uncommon Allegiance and Valor. And we've been in this series for quite a number of months now. It, it seems as though it's almost been half a year. And we're progressing through the books of 1 Samuel and 2 Samuel. We're down in the book of 2 Samuel in the 6th chapter. And today we're going to be focused more so on verses 1 through 8. And we're going to be talking about some things there. Amen. Amen. It is time to perfect our worship unto the Lord God Almighty. Somebody ought to say that with me. It is time to perfect your worship unto the Lord God Almighty. Amen. Amen. So looking at 2 Samuel, the sixth chapter, verses one through eight through eight, and I'll read that in verse one. It says, again, David gathered together all the chosen men of Israel, 30,000 men, 30,000. And David arose and went with all the people that were with him from Baalai of Judah to bring from thence the ark of God, whose name is called by the name of the Lord of hosts that dwelleth between the cherubims. And they set the ark of God upon a new car and brought it out of the house of Abinadab that was in Gebar. And Uzzah and Aholio, the sons of Abinadab, drave the new cart, and they brought it out of the house of Abinadab, which was at Gibeah. A cord accompanying the ark of God, and Ahoah went before the ark. And David and all the house of Israel played before the Lord on all manner of instruments made of fir wood, even of or harps, and on psalteries, and on timbrels, and on coronets, and on cymbals. And when it came to Nature's threshing floor, Uzzai put forth his hand to the ark of God and took hold of it, for the oxen shook it. And the anger of the Lord was kindled against Uzzai, and God smote him there for his error, and there he died by the ark of God. And David was displeased because the Lord made a breach upon Uzzai, and he called the name of that place Para Uzzah to this day. Amen. And today we're going to be talking about David's attempt to bring the ark of God back. And for a subtitle, let's not be erroneous with our worship and how we worship God. Amen. So if we look at the scriptures, we see that there are multiple things going on here. 
And I want to start off very off by making several statements that the Lord put in my heart. Just because we may be anointed and called of God and have a heart for him doesn't necessarily equate to us knowing how to entertain or usher God in our presence. Or better yet, us into his presence. We can't for a moment think that he's obligated to come in by our standards of worship and neglect what he has already prescribed as the right way to enter in. Even our even a representation of what appears to be right can often be wrong, yielding catastrophic results and events. Even good intentions aren't enough for God. But being an understanding person of what he wants is a critical key to keep in mind. Too many presumes that they can touch, minister, usher in the presence, etc. without understanding him, God, first and foremost. Without understanding and acknowledging his ways and adhering to what he wants and what he desires. We see that David had very good intentions in the very first verse of this chapter. And David gathered together all the chosen men of Israel. David's intent was to bring God, the true king of Israel, back with all the pomp, with all the ceremony, with all of the circumstances that are worthy of a dignitary, of a king, of a God, of our God, the soul God, the creator of all things. David purposed in his heart that he would gather together all the chosen men of Israel. Let's talk about that for a moment. He decided that he was going to bring the most worthy warriors in his army, the chosen men. So let's talk about that. Men who understood times and seasons, men who understood rank and its privileges and the authority that goes along with it, men who were skilled, men who loved God, worshiped God, and adored him, but yet they were strong in military might, which means that they were going to protect the ark of God in the processional at all costs. These men were willing to lay down their lives for David. But beyond David, they were willing to lay down their lives to bring back to Israel the crowning jewel of what made them a people. The Ark of the Covenant, the pure earthly representation of God, where whose name God dwelled between the cherubims, these men who came with David understood the importance of this moment and what it meant to Israel to see that return. And the Bible says in the very second verse of this chapter, and David arose, he arose, he got up, he, he put on his garb, he went out purposely with a heart that we're going to bring back Yeshua Mashiach, we're going to bring back Jesus Christ, the, the pre-earthly ordained and manifestation of God dwelling amongst the people of God, Jehovah in the form of a presence that lived between the cherubims on the Ark of the Covenant of God Almighty. David understood that building a temple or having a tabernacle without the existence of God was a waste. It was vanity. It was fruitile. It was frivolous. It was lacking meaning to the heart. These men that went along with David had to understand the seriousness of the hour 
we're going to be returning to the house of God, the tabernacle of God, the very essence of his presence amongst us. That's... This is Apostle William Whitfield. We are actually here with our five-minute segment in the Word. We're actually traveling this week, and we're just giving praise and thanks unto the Lord God Almighty for new opportunities. One of the things that I want to share with you this morning comes from Psalms 136 and verse 1, where it says, Oh, give thanks unto the Lord, for he is good, and his mercy endureth forever. We always have to have a spirit of appreciation for the things that God is doing in our lives, whether those things we seemingly are enjoying and they're positive and we're loving them and we're just reaping the benefits of God's blessings. But also, when God deals us something else in our lives that is less than favorable or something comes into our lives, not necessarily by the will or the mind or the hand of God, but because we know in Scripture it says this is the will of God concerning you in Christ Jesus, we gravitate towards those things positively. We gravitate towards those things because we know that God has our best interests in mind. And because we know that God is concerned about us at every single stage and every single point of our lives, we appreciate and we approach him by giving thanks unto him. We give thanks unto him for he is definitely good, as the scriptures say. But the main thing is that his mercies endureth forever. Even in the book of Lamentation, it talks about how God's mercies are new every single morning from that third chapter there. We know that the man there goes through a lot, and he's talking about a lot of different things that has befallen him. But yet at the same time, he understands that the key to his relationship and walk with the Lord isn't based upon complaining. It's not based upon his outlook or his perspective. It's not based upon those who come and tell him about his horrific, terrible situation, as in the book of Job. But this is a man who has allowed his mind and his spirit and his soul to refocus. One of the things that someone told me years ago and I'll never forget the statement. I will never forget where I was. I will never forget who said it to me. I will never forget the time of day that it was stated. But one of the things that they have said that to me that you have gone through a lot of horrific things in your life. But the thing that you have failed to do was to thank the Lord for that. Immediately, as soon as that person said it, my mind immediately went through multiple chains of thought. It went through the thought, why should I give thanks unto the Lord? But yet at the end of that thought process, it concluded that I needed to give thanks to the Lord. And immediately the tears began to flow. I began to open up my mouth and I began to give thanks to the Lord for all the things he brought me out of, but all the things that he allowed me to experience the pain, the agony, the difficulty, people telling lies, losing things, and all of that, you would say, why would you give thanks unto the Lord? Because when we learn to give thanks unto the Lord, not just for the good things in life, but we learn to give thanks to the Lord for even those horrible things that have gone in our lives, poor health, poor finances, bad decisions. 
Whenever we give thanks to the Lord, it changes our mindset. It changes our mindset to refocus on him that regardless of what we have gone through, he is always good. And listen to this. By giving thanks to the Lord in the midst of your circumstances, it actually causes the time that you spend in it to be lessened. Oh, give thanks unto the Lord because his mercy sustained you and kept you while you were going through. So regardless of what you're going through today, give thanks to the Lord because he is good. God bless you.